is kind of how do we do this, right? How do we put this together? And so, again, same kind of structure and format, but it's kind of learning to look at it in a different way. And, of course, we're dealing with text. So this time you will, because the story I will give you will have page numbers on it, okay? So once you mention that author's name, we're just writing about one source, right? And remember, when you're only writing about one source, once you give the author's name, it's not that you'll never use it again, but for your in-text citations, all you need is that page number, okay? So that's all you need. Now, if you're doing APA and you go to a new paragraph and you give the author's name again, then the first time you would put that date because author date, right? They go right there together. But we're doing MLA, so it's just author and location. So all you're going to need to do when you give a quote or you give an example from, yeah, this was on page six, whatever, is just that page number. Cool? I like MLA because it's, yeah, less stuff to worry about. Um, all right, so key things to remember, of course, always treat those titles correctly, that convention for the author's names, those in-text citations, and we'll look at them. And, of course, we're going to have a works cited page. And here it's just works cited because we're just using one, so that's all we need. Um, now, we've got to have that clear thesis. And this is nice because I'm giving you questions, so your thesis is just the answer to the question. And, of course, the rest of the paper just explains it. How would you get there? Um, now, Here's where you've got to go beyond with your thesis with literature <coughs> that obvious. For us to write a paper about the fact that this, you know, one of the themes of this story is people should be honest in the first place instead of trying to hide things. Yeah, I mean, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the necklace was fake. They spent a lot of time they didn't have to when they found out that it was really, you know, that it was fake. I mean, that's just not going to give us much. We're going to be repeating the paper, the story, pretty much. So that's where we have to really go deeper. Um, and, of course, we've got to be able to support it with those direct quotes. And that's where you decide. When you get a question you have to answer, you say, okay, how long does this paper need to be? You know, what examples can I find? Okay, these are enough to fill that space up. Um, so it's one of them. And, of course, here you've got to connect to one of these, at least one or two elements of fiction because we're using the terminology of it. If we were writing in psychology, we'd be using the terminology of psychology. If we were writing in computing, we'd be using the terminology of computing. Whatever it is, we'd be using that terminology. So as you move into your field, here's an interesting fact for you. And this was years ago, so I don't know what the numbers are, but about 20 years ago, I, I heard this, God, I can't believe I can say about 20 years ago, thank God, and I was an adult then, <laughs> it's weird. Um, so I heard this, this fact that the average college freshman, and that was at that time, and that's just like the traditional 18-year-old freshman, um, comes into college with 10,000 words that they use on a daily, regular basis, 10,000. That's not that many when you think about all the words there are in a language. Right? That over four years of college, a college student will, learn, will end up with 30,000 that they use on a regular basis. So 18 years of your life, 10,000. And so you're doubling that, more than that, right? Ending up with 30,000 by the end of college career. And that's because you learn, one is you just learn more vocabulary. You learn more words. Um, the other one is you learn a lot of those words that are specific to your field. And one of the key things when you're writing for other fields is say, wait, what is their terminology? What do they use? Don't throw in any other big words just to throw in a big word. Well, those howevers, nevertheless, those kind of things. But you, that's part of making those more natural to you. Um, but when you have technical terms, those are the ones you want to throw in and make sure that they're the right one. So we definitely need to use some of that vocabulary. Um, and again, this is kind of being flexible. Um, just kind of as you work through the essay, you kind of realize what it is. Now, the first time, it's good, and I talked to this about this with film. Just watch it, right? You try to analyze it too much, then you need the story under your belt. Be able to say, expect that I'm going to ask you every day for the next week and a half, okay, what's the basic plot of this story? Right? Just understand, say, okay, well, what just really happened? And what are these people like? You do that, that's your best start with this kind of thing. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to go to the questions, that kind of thing. Um, when you read it a second time, same, same thing we did with film. 
when you got, we watched Wrecked, whenever you got your homework stuff, you went home, got on YouTube, watched a little bit more of that, right? May not be the whole thing, but little bits and pieces that you were going to talk about. And so that's where you're really starting to focus and say, let me look deeply. When you first read about her getting that necklace, you noticed, no doubt, that she was really excited about it. But did you think about it in the terms of those words that I pointed out? That's that second read. That's that next read of saying, oh, wait, this is like not just she was excited. She trembled, right? Her heart beat, whatever it says, right? All those things. That tells me even more. Um, and then, of course, I mean, this is just steps of, you know, going through. And this is why, yeah, you get to use, I give you the story. I'm like, write on it, whatever. That's when once you decide, what am I going to write about? Then you go through and you find those moments. You highlight them. You make notes. You whatever. Ask questions. You look up words and say, okay, what is really being said here more than just she was excited? What else does this tell us? Um, blah, 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 blah. No questions. Your paper is the answer. Remember, with formal writing, your paper is the answer, and that's really key. Um, all right, three steps, blah, 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 blah. What I want to do is look at Matilde. So this is, I'm going to show you kind of how I started, basically, and then we'll look at the essay that I wrote from this. This is my starting point um, um, in terms of this. Um, let's see. Okay, well, in writing down the basics, the author says, the author <laughs> says, good questions to ask when analyzing character are what did you learn about this character from his or her actions or speeches or from the actions or speeches about this character? What does this show you about human condition, circumstance, and theme of the work? Now, here's what's really interesting. Um, because when I went through this, one of the things that stood out for me um, was those descriptive words. That he didn't just say she's excited, that you know she was this or that, she trembled, she did all these things. Right? We get not just the the narrator telling us about Matilde being, I'd like to say, the drama queen, but like all these words that just like heighten it even more, that make it not just excitable but drama queen to that elevate it to that point. Um, and so those descriptive words and those emotions, to me, that description told me a lot more about who she was as a character. So I decided to focus on this idea of, you know, character and how does description really show us more about who Matilde is than anything she says, anything like that. I think these descriptions for me. And so that's what stood out. So that's what I'm focused on. Um, so anyway, I'm, we're not citing other things, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, you'll have everything you need to cite. So here's what I did. Now here's what's totally interesting. Was I started doing this because, again, whenever I give assignments, if I'm giving a new assignment, um, if I'm going to put together a new lecture or something, I go through and do what I'm asking you to do. If I can't do it, <laughs> right? I mean, I should at least be able to do this if I expect y'all to. So I do it. And so I was going through, you know, thinking about these steps, and I'm like, well, do your steps. If you're going to say this is the first thing you do, then, Kelly, do that. So I read the story. I'd read it before, but I read it again. I read it many times before. I read it again. Um, and then I decided, okay, what am I going to write about? Okay, I want to write about how this description shows us more about her character than then we get if we just think about what she says and what she does when we get these descriptions. Um, and so then what I did was I went back to the story and I said, okay, let me just look at every moment where we get a description of either how she's acting or reacting or kind of what's in her brain. And this is what's cool. So I started going, I went through and I copied and pasted. So we get, here, here are the things um, so far. Um, or at the start of the story, she suffered endlessly because she thought she was born to have more. She suffered endlessly. I mean, that dude, that tells us something about her, right? Um, not having nasty things tormented and insulted her. No, it's not just she was bugged by it, she was irritated. No, this tormented and insulted her. She imagined exquisite pieces of furniture, priceless ornaments, perfumed rooms, delicate meals, gleaming silver tapestries, delicate foods served in marvelous dishes, murmured gallantries. I mean, this is all, she's not telling us this. We're getting this narrator telling us this. This is what's going on in her head, man. She's got these, 
She sees these fancy dinners, all this stuff going on, right? Um, she suffered. We get the word suffered about Matilda a whole lot. After visiting her friend because her friend had so much more. Um, when her husband brings home the invitation, she cries and with a violent effort overcame her grief because she had nothing to wear. Thank God. Um, she says she's utterly miserable at not having um, at having not having jewels to wear. When she finds the necklace, here's that one. Her heart began to beat covetously. Her hands trembled as she lifted it. She remained in ecstasy at the sight of it. You know, I mean, those are just such loaded words. Um, when her friend says she'll lend it to her, she flung herself on her friend's breast and embraced her frenziedly. And this is just, man, crazy. And then at the ball, she danced madly, ecstatically, drunk with pleasure, in triumph of her beauty, in the pride of her success, in a cloud of happiness. Dude, right? And so I'm there copying and pasting, copying and pasting like a good girl I'm supposed to be, right? Okay, this is what I'm telling students to do. Just go through, highlight, pull out those quotes. You can make decisions later. I knew if I'm writing a shorter paper, I'm probably not going to use all of these, but hey, right? And what's really interesting was I get to that point, and I had read the necklace time, time, time. I mean, I literally cannot tell you how many times there's bunches of them before. The first time I read this story, I was like in high school. So I'd read it a lot. And I just kind of pictured her this way, except for once they lose it, you know, on the downside, all the time. But what was interesting was when I started looking for the descriptions, I noticed something interesting. So at the point, um, this is after she loses the necklace. Check out how these changes of her, you know, what's going on in her mind and how she's described emotionally reacting. During the second part, so there's very little description of her emotions. I mean, it really feels, and this shocked me. I didn't realize it. It says she sits while he goes out to look for the necklace, lacking the strength to get into bed, huddled on a chair without volition or power of thought. That doesn't actually even, it just says she can't think about anything. She's just numb, right? Doesn't really actually tell us about her reaction. Besides, she couldn't do anything. Wait, she was frenzied. She was trembling. She was all these other things before. What? And I'm like, oh, okay, well, that's one. Cool, right? But then at the end, it says, of the end of the scene, it says, by the end of the week, they'd lost all hope. Okay. Um, in looking to the, replace the necklace, the narrator describes them as ill with remorse and anguish of mind. So ill and anguish of mind. You know, those are kind of weighty words, but still not even close to what that first part gave us in terms of like the heightened emotional content. Um, it says, um, as they're paying it off, it describes her as haggled and insulted. But we're, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of that. Um, and then after the debts were paid off, of course, Madame Louise looked old now. That's one of the things it says. Both of those are actually more physical descriptions of her than in her mind, her heart, her personality, her character. Um, the only time she dreams in the second part, and of course that first part we get all those murmured gallantries, those fancy feasts with the silver platters. and I mean, she got dreams going everywhere, right? The only time she dreams in the second part, it says, but sometimes when her husband was at the office, she sat down by the window and she thought of that evening long ago of the ball, what she, um, where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost the necklace? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, she can't even dream of that what would have happened. She just stops there. So this shocked the shit out of me because I had read this story so many times and I kind of expected, I mean, in my mind, I saw Mathilde as reacting in those same ways she had in the first part, but when I really looked at it, I'm like, there's really nothing here. I mean, this description just goes down. Do you think Mapusant just got lazy? No, right? What it really shows, and then I thought, I'm like, wow. I mean, I was just floored because she is such a drama queen in the first part. I mean, this is like this heightened emotion and all these things. And then it goes from that to nothing. Nothing. I mean, the description just drops off in terms of her emotions, her feelings, that kind of thing. That's it. And I was like, you know what? 
I think that's saying something. I think that's saying something very clear. And so in that moment, right, I may rewrite this later. I may decide I don't agree with this as much, but that me then who wrote this, you know, what I'm showing you, you know, said, wait, there's some distinction here. Something is going on. That's so much emotion at the first and at the end. And what does it mean? So I just kind of have some warm-up writing here. But, you know, what I said is I think by so vividly characterizing Mathilde's illusions and delusions early in the story and painting such a vivid picture of her, the writing itself becomes another layer of description. Warming up. Okay, um, the style is sparse, bare prose. Um, the style, the style, sparse, bare prose at the end is a reflection of her life. It's not that her character changes from having things to not having them. It's that she changes from being able to imagine having them to not being able to imagine. And for me, this is a moment when I'm looking at, is Ma Poussant saying something about the despair of being in debt, of being in poverty in these ways? Right? Is he saying something about dreaming is a luxury in a way? That, you know, whenever we're in those moments where all we can do is work to barely make ends meet, do we have that luxury to dream? Does it change the character of who we are, how we behave, I was doing that too. I'm like, oh shit, that's damn good, right? Because there's that moment when I'm looking at this and I'm like, wow, Mapusan is almost showing us two different people. So it's not just that, oh, her circumstances have changed, but this circumstance creates a very real change in her. And so by looking at that, by just copying and pasting and saying, let me look at these descriptions and just taking those and then having that moment when I was shocked, I'd read this so much and I didn't notice that in the second half, those are just gone, right? Part of what creates that bleakness is not having that. But, you know, I decided that I thought, you know, it's more than just the writing. It's also saying something about this situation for who she is in that moment. Um, so that's where I go with that. And then, you know, then I've got to say, well, how do I kind of put that together to make that this fancy, fancy, you know, pinky in the air um, sounding thesis. And again, I got some warm up here. Um, in looking closely at how Matilda is described in terms of her thoughts and emotions, we can see that her character changes not only from having things to not having them, but also from being able to imagine having them to not being able to imagine. This is not a change in action. This is a deep change in character, the very heart of who she is. So my thesis, okay, so which one of these elements and what does it do? What does it show us? By using description and the lack of it, Ma Poussant, because he's the writer and he's making decisions about what he gives us and what he doesn't, Ma Poussant illustrates the power of poverty and desperation over not simply the human mind, but also the very depths of a person's personality. The very depths may be a little dramatic, but hey, it's English class. You can do this yet. Okay. So that was really how I came to that, this idea that I had never had about this story. And, and I love this story because I love having those moments where you see something that you've seen over and over and you notice these details about it. And so it was just, though, it really was that simple copy and paste or highlight, you know, really say, okay, if I'd have been highlighting it on paper, I'd have been highlighting part of it, you know, all of it in one color. And then I'd have gone back and re-highlighted that second part and said, wait, Different things, different people, right? So that definitely did that. After that, it's just a matter of using those e examples I already pulled out, right? I've already pulled out all my evidence. I just got to decide. Can't use it all because that first list was really long, right? Now, it depends. If my paper was longer, I would. Okay. Um, but if I'm doing a fairly short paper like we're doing, I'm just going to kind of, what's the most pertinent? So it's really about putting that in. Um, so once you decide on an element, and here would be a question to answer, you, you know, you read it first, right? You let yourself just be there. Once you decide on a question to answer, and what I would challenge you to do for the next couple of days, and what we'll do some of the practice is I'll actually be giving you, I'll put you in groups and say, pick a question. You don't get to look at it, right? And then, you know, I'll have copies of the um, stories to um, and then we'll practice some of this kind of body writing, too, to get us some more hundreds, things like that. Um, but really looking and saying, okay, 
what's going on with this? Whatever my question's about, whether it's about description or character or the theme, that deeper meaning. Um, and see, I could tie this into theme, too, because I could say through using description of the character, Ma Poussant is saying this deeper thing. So it was just a matter of how I reworded that thesis in terms of what I want to include. I can reword it different ways. Um, so let's take a look real quick. Here's, here's what I ended up doing. Let's see if I earned my, um, my degree. Hmm. We'll see. I know this is better than a lot. Oh, it's because, I've, okay, I've got comments in it. I was going to say, wait, why is this margin all the way over here? You know, so, so MLA, though, it should be over on the right, but I've got comments. So it's moved the margin over. So we've got last name, your last name, and the page number, and then just um, you, professor, July 19, that's my birthday. I put my mom's, my dad's, mine in, you know. And then the class. Um, and then we have our title. And I've got unmaking Mathilde, colon, description as character in Guy de, de Maupassant's The Necklace. So wherever I write that title, I'm going to treat it correctly everywhere. Right? Okay, so um, I start with big ideas. right? What's the kind of subject overall? Well, I am, one thing I'm talking about is dreams. I'm like, dude, I'll start talking about dreams, right? Power of dreams cannot be underestimated. If we can imagine, if we can imagine we can do things, there's hope of achieving better and moving beyond our present circumstances. However, when any possibility of achieving those dreams is whisked away, we run the risk of losing hope and falling into the grasp of despair. Guy de Maupassant, so whole name first time, in his story, The Necklace, even though that's in my title, it needs to, your, your paper needs to be able to stand without your title. So don't start by saying in this story, because every teacher is going to write which one. Okay. Um, in the story, the necklace creates a picture of this. It is a picture that illustrates the way in which possibility or the lack of it can affect who a person is. By using description and the lack of it, Mapusan illustrates the power of poverty and desperation excuse me, over not simply the human mind, but also the very depths of a person's personality. So there's that thesis. You can see I modified it a little bit from that kind of first one because, it, you know, once you get it into your writing. So now I've just got to show you how I got to that. Um, the first part of the story has descriptions of Matilde's emotions that show how she imagines things on a grand scale. Get those topic sentences in. Those direct you Direct your reader, where are you going? What is this paragraph about? First part of the story, and that's where we see these emotions. And now i got to give them. She imagines grand wealth and position that she doesn't have but thinks she should. She feels as if she was born to have more. So I'm paraphrasing, putting it in my own words, but it's still from the story. And here and there I'm using quotes. Um, born to have more, and because of this, she suffers. Now, the version I used this from was from the web, and when we scroll, there were no page numbers on the necklace, right? So we wouldn't have those page numbers if it was web. If we had page numbers, all I would do is, like right here, I would go ahead, because I have specific pages, I'm going to go ahead and make sure and put like five or whatever it is. And I'll have my, she suffers, quotes, space, those parentheses with just the five in it, no P in MLA. So just the number, and then that period at the end. Um, when she visits her wealthy friend, Madame Forrester, and she sees she has all that she has, and in, in the version I was reading from at the time, that Madame and Mazelle were all um, abbreviated, like Mr. and Ms., that kind of thing. Um, and see she ha all she has, but Tilda again suffers, because seeing her friend in all the luxury makes her weep all day long. The idea of not having nice things tormented and insulted her. When she realized she has no jewels to wear with her new dress, she is utterly miserable. So that's part of, I had that long list we saw in the slideshow before of all these things. And I'm like, okay, can't give them all. Let's just narrow them down. So I really kind of pick those things that work. Um, and then I've got to explain. Each of these descriptions shows how Mathilde sees herself. They are clues to her character and create a picture of a woman who always wants more and is never satisfied with the things she has. Even though it's noted that other women in her positions would have been happy with what she had. And I'm discussing this here, but I'm also referring to a specific part of the story. So if I had page numbers on this, I would go in and put whatever page that was, three. 
whatever. Um, Matilda is not those other women. She believes that the life of wealth and finery are meant for her, and the descriptions of her, of her emotions create a vision of how much not having that pains her. In fact, she seems to play the role of the martyr, bearing her sufferings as if she really was a princess hidden in some poor man's house. A Cinderella. Ah, okay, cool. So that takes care of that first part. Now I've really got to talk about you know, I've got to give that second part and then make that connection as to how much she's changed. So here's my topic sentence. The narrator goes on to show us other nuances of Matilde's character and paints her as a very dramatic woman who imagines the extremes, the very best and worst of things, through his descriptions of her emotions. There is no middle ground for Matilde. She is clearly dramatic and has an overactive imagination. So I'm going to give some more of this... Um, this um, Evidence. This was clearly when I was having students write longer papers. Aren't you glad you are my students now? And I teach colons better, too. She fantasizes about the life of wealth and position, things that are beyond her social standing, and she has access to those things. It is as if her, as if her life is made whole because of those things. She imagined exquisite pieces of furniture, priceless ornaments, perfumed rooms. And there, because, I, you know, I'm just really looking at these words that kind of show us her character there. I'm using those ellipses to kind of get rid of the rest. This isn't about the whole point of what she's thinking in that moment. It's about how is this description doing that thing. Um, delicate meals, gleaming silver tapestries, delicate food served in marvelous dishes, murmured gallantries. When she finds the necklace at her friends and holds it up to look at it, her heart began to beat covetously. Her hands trembled as she lifted it. She remained in ecstasy at the sight of herself. When Madame Forrester says she'll lend Mathilde the diamond necklace, Mathilde Matild flung herself on her friend's breast, embraced her frenziedly at the ball. She dan oh, and at the ball... I should have, you know, and finally at the ball, or finally at the ball. She danced madly, ecstatically, drunk with pleasure in the triumph of her beauty, in the pride of her success, in a cloud of happiness. Here we see that Matilda is not a woman whose social status allows for those things. She is able to imagine herself in, a, in those social situations. While Matilda's. Um, when she finally has an opportunity to participate for one night in that social scene, she throws herself into it with wild abandon. She feels entitled to these things and life as if she disturbs, deserves them for just being who she is. And since she's not actually part of that social class, she lives in the country of that imagination. Now, strictly speaking, I don't think we need this paragraph to make the point. Yeah, I mean, I think the first set of examples are clear. But this is how you develop. If you're like, wait, this needs to be longer, you say, can I give more examples? Can I talk about this a little further? So for what we're doing in class, you probably won't have as many par paragraphs. Aren't you glad we're doing this in class, not out of class, right? If you're doing it out of class, it'd be longer, and you'd be like, oh, I need more words. You'd say, wait, can I give some more of those examples? And that's where you make those choices. That's where you look at that evidence and say, OK, if, if it's going to be shorter, let me give the most compelling. All right, let me just start with those. If it's going to be longer, well, OK, here I can give this her daily life, and here I can give this the ball and those kinds of moments. Um, so that's one way to think about development. However, now we get to that second part of that thesis, right? A shift occurs once Matilde and her husband find the necklace is missing. Based on her reactions to things before, it would seem... And here's where I'm pointing out what is the expectation, because that's one of the things I discovered in doing this, was I expected that second part to be just as dramatic, just on the depressing side. Right? And so it would seem that, um, where's it at? Um, it would seem that she would be described as an emotional mess. She seems like the kind of person up to this point who would make a big fuss about losing the necklace and who would sob and cry. But during that whole section of the story, there's very little description of her emotions. It's as if they've just dropped off the face of the earth. She is dumbfounded, which would be typical, but she does not respond with emotion. Instead, she sits while her husband goes out to look for the necklace, lacking the strength to get into bed, huddled on a chair without volition or power of thought. She's described a bit later as in a state of bewilderment. At the end of that scene, the narrator says, by the end of the week, they had lost all hope. 
this is the breaking point for Mathilde. So what does this show me? Um, she knows that the chance she once had to achieve the dream she's cherished has disappeared. Those dreams are no longer in her reach, even in her imagination. Her imagination is paralyzed by her circumstances, so there is nothing to describe and no fantasy to, to indulge in. As we move toward the end of the story, we see descriptions of Mathilde's physical state, but we no longer get descriptions of her emotions. As her husband and her are paying off the debt, the narrator describes her as haggling, insulted. After the debts are paid off, the narrator says Ma Madame Louisa looked old now, yet there are no descriptions of her emotions. Oh, it's a little repetitive. See how reading it out loud, you're like, oh, wait. Oh, okay. Um, so I would get rid of it probably here. Um, I would just say it's as if she shut down. The only reference to her past life is when she dreams of the day of the ball. But sometimes, when her husband was at the office, she sat down by the window and she thought of that evening long ago, of the ball where she had been so beautiful and so admired. What would have happened if she had not lost that necklace? Who knows? Who knows? And this break is there because it's paragraphs. Since I'm quoting paragraphs there, more than those four lines, once I paste it in, I bring that indention to show it's a new paragraph there. So now I've got to discuss it. The Matilde in the first story, and this is comparison, right? So now I really want to spend most of it talking about the how do these two compare. Um, the Matilde in the first of the story would have indulged in the glory of that evening over and over. She would have longed for it and relived it as often as she could. However, in this description, there is no vision of beauty and glory as we saw in the first of the story. That Matilde is gone. Here is a woman who does not think of fancy dresses and what she should have, but a woman who only questions things and does not let herself fall into the fantasies of the past. There we go. This is different. Now the big so what? Because I said this is like total change of character, and I haven't even talked about that yet, right? So here's where I want to do that. And in a summary, you can briefly summarize what you said, but you want to go beyond that. It's Your conclusion is not just summary. Your conclusion is what do you conclude? What are you, what's your big points, right? Um, through description of Matilde's emotion, we see her progress from a woman who constantly dreams and fantasizes about more than she can have. Her images of the finest things, the wealth and the fine company, illustrate her personality and show her as a woman who can see the life, see the life of a celebrity, but who is not quite there. As the story progresses and the descriptions of her emotions deteriorate, she is put into a position where even imagining that life is so unfeasible, she is no longer able to conceptualize of it. Like so many people in our world, and so here's where I'm going from Matilde, from the necklace, this story that was written in the late 1800s, to us, today, to the Kardashians, right? Like so many people... Um, in our world, she has had to live a life of bare existence. Simply to survive, she must work from the time she wakes up until the time she goes to bed. And even then, what she has is only enough for basic subsistence. To take the time out of this life and dream of wealth and a celebrated life is not a possibility. Um, if she has a chance to think of her glory days, she does not dream of the dresses or the jewels or the finery. She only questions what if. She has no hope. The breaking point change is not simply her circumstances, but also her very personality. Indeed, her friend says, oh, my poor Mathilde, how you are changed. However, Mathilde's change is more than surface. And while her journey through hell may have redeemed her as a person, getting rid of her vanity and pride, it has left her with no dreams, no imagination, and no hope. Oh, my God, that's pretty bleak. I must have been depressed when I wrote that. <laughs> There's no hope. Right. Um, so, again, it's about kind of building those connections through, right? And that kind of going from, okay, here's this thing I see, this answer I have, what things support it, right? And sometimes, in this example, I started with the evidence. I didn't even look at the question. I'm just like, look, I noticed these things. I'm interested in how she's the drama queen. And I did not plan to write this essay. I planned to write an essay about her just being the drama queen all the way through. And then when I got to that second part and I start looking for descriptions, and I can remember this because I was standing at my kitchen counter. It was like, 
had to be a spring session or something like that, or maybe I was teaching a summer session because it was warm in the kitchen. Like I can, I do a lot of work with the laptop at the kitchen counter, standing up, cup of coffee. You know, coffee's close. That's good, right? Um, and I remember standing there and doing that, and then just kind of looking and going, "Oh my God, that they're, they're gone!" Right? And so, it, what's really one of the things you have to be flexible about is sometimes you learn. A story isn't what you expect. Even though I had in my mind that drama queen Mathilde and just kind of transposed that into the second half whenever she's in that moment where she has to actually get down to work. Now, could I use the same evidence and write it differently? Yeah. Right? You know, still kind of like it. So, And then, of course, at the end I'll have my um, citation. And so you're going to have a basic... Um, Citation from a magazine, so whenever, oh, I can't, oh, I can bring this up, though. Yeah, whenever we cite. And we'll look at this when I hand out the paper, too, again. Um, so, again, how do we cite? We look it up. Remember, don't, one, you don't want to memorize all of it. You have to memorize all of it because they're all just a little bit different. I mean, even within APA and, and MLA, there are basic um there are those basic minor differences. So always look it up. Don't try to memorize it. It's a waste of your time. You've got, you've got more things you need to fill your head with, okay? So we would have, here we'd have Ma Poussant. We'd have the necklace. We'd have whatever the name of the magazine is. So um, that, if there's a number, date, location. So if there's a volume or anything like that, we'd have that. The date, as much of the date as we have. And then we'd have pages, what pages it's on, and that period at the end, okay?